Ladies and gentlemen, once in a while I'm told that I have a big head. But today I need it because I'm here in my capacity wearing three hats. The first one is to welcome you into this distinguished and well-known village district of Carnage as the Member of Parliament for Diego Martin West. That's my first hat. And the second hat that I wear is that of the Chairman of the National Security Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And the third hat is Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. There are three different responsibilities, but let me first focus on that of Member of Parliament. I've been the Member of Parliament for this area for quite some time. And as a Member of Parliament, you're forever looking to improve the infrastructure of the district so as to provide services for those who live in the district, provide opportunities, and overall to provide them with a better quality of life. To do that, a number of projects fall before you, and each area might have a claim on what is more important, and you have to prioritize. Because usually, you can't do everything one time. But there usually is a development program going on from year to year, from month to month, from government to government, and so on. So this project today is probably, I shouldn't say probably, this has been the hardest project for me as MP to get done. We have been able to get the Carnage Boys School built. So the girls' school that used to house all the children, boys and girls, overcrowding. We now have a fine boys' school in Carnage, and nobody remembers when Carnage children were living, you know, like in a sardine can. That was priority number one. We got that done. Then we got, if you look around, we see we also had another problem in Point Kumana, where the Point Kumana RC school was an old dwelling house, kind of, on a small plot of land. We managed to build a multi-story school there, so there's a, there are two schools in Carnage now, the Carnage Government Primary School and the Carnage RC School. That problem has gone up, new one already. We're currently working on the Diego Martin Girls RC School, which had to be condemned a few months ago because of physical condition deterioration, and that is under construction. A contract has been awarded, and work should be going on there. This western district of the country is sport crazy, as you know. A lot of sportsmen came from Karanaj and other areas from down here. National captains, national footballers, national athletes. We always felt that we didn't have the facility that was worthy of the effort or the facility that will bring out the talent that just resides among our population from Diego Martin, East, Central, and West. But recently, we've had the opportunity to open what we in the West believe is the finest community stadium in Trinidad and Tobago, the Diego Martin Sporting Complex. And I must tell you that since it has been open, it has been the place of choice for sporting activities, and there's a whole lot more coming, and the communities are alive and well engaged in healthy activity at the Diego Martin Sporting Complex. Right to my left here, recently we had opened up the Carnage Health Center, fine facility, having replaced one that was substandard. So over time, we have been adding to the infrastructure. The Karanash Fishing Center, which is still yet not fully utilized, but the potential for utilization is there, and it has brought significant improvement to the landing and handling of fish, and it has the potential to become an economic entity here in the village, and we're working on that. There's some more work going on there. But the Karanash Fishing Complex has been completed and is now in use. And that brings me to the Carnage Police Station. Why was the Carnage Police Station so low down the priority list? And it is because there are so many people involved in the decision making in this country that sometimes decisions are very difficult to convert into operation. When I became MP for this era in 1991, the Carnage Police Station was at the top of the priority list. Because we've always, in recent years, had an issue of safety and security. And the Carnage Police Station, one of the oldest in the country, and covers one of the more active areas, including coastline, including industrial, including separate villages, and close to an urban area. That, this is a priority police station. 
Carnage Police Station became dilapidated and unsuited for its role over time. And we started making plans for a new police station. First problem, where do we locate it? And that became an issue for everybody involved. You know, people now in Trinidad and Tobago tell you that you mustn't do anything without having everybody involved. That's how the Greeks used, the Greeks used to operate in Grecian times. Everybody come down to the square and everybody talk and everybody vote. That is how democracy started. Good foundation. But you try that now and see what's going to happen to you. Because everybody, everybody's an expert. And especially if you don't know, you talk the most. And if you have nothing to contribute, you demand to take care of the situation. So the location of the Carnage police station became an issue that lasted for years. Because no one person had the authority to say, do this and do it here and proceed to get the station built. Every person who had a say had a different input. We ended up with the police station having to remain where it was because it is a historic station. You can't leave here because you can't leave what was built in whenever it was built. That was the first option. The second option was to build it on lands that were not suited physically. The third option was to take it out of the village and build it in Shagaramas. That those options, each option I mentioned there, has to go through the system and take years before they're thrown out. And some embers never die. They keep smoldering and returning every so often. We reached the stage at one point where the site was selected and agreed upon by the police that had a lot to say in this matter. Because I as MP, in government and in opposition, had to get the police input into this. And some elements of the police, depending on who we are in the uniform or who is more aggressive, decide what is going to happen. So half said leave it there. The other half said build it behind there. And of course, it wasn't built. And this went on for quite some time because the contributors could not agree. And everybody is a boss and everybody has an authority to interfere with it. The end result was one day as MP, I took up the papers and I saw, and I heard on the news as well, Carnage police officers left Carnage police station and walked to four roads, refusing to work in Carnage police station. That was the outcome of all the consultation and all the involvement, and this is going on for years. And you would think that as MP, I have the authority to say no, do it there. No, you don't have that authority. And you would think that as prime minister, I have the authority to say, do it there? No, I become a dictator. And then we came eventually, eventually, to the point of having the Karanash police station to be built on a piece of state land next door. State land next door. Turns out, after all the preparations for that, and I finally exhale that my second to last major project is going to come to conclusion, I'm Prime Minister of the country and I have some authority and I agree as national security because I managed to encourage the police to behave yourself and accept the police station in the best location. Turns out, this piece of land, state lease, lease expire, the state wants back the land, the owner says no, no. Owner dead, the heirs of the owner say no, no. If you want back this land, you're going to pay us millions. We get a lawyer. We go into court. You can't have it. And then one government department says, you can't acquire it compulsorily because it is the state's own. So the state can't acquire the state's land. So no compulsory acquisition. That is six months more of law. And then the other one says, you have to set a clear legitimate expectation. After all them big words and all them months and years wasted, we eventually have to abandon that. Otherwise, all now, we still will be building a Carolina's police station. Fortunately, this piece of land, which is also state land, is available. And after all this period, we then determine that this is the piece of land we'll have to use because those problems are no longer with us. So today, 
I want to welcome the contractor inside. It's a, fa it's a familiar contractor. NH International, NH Local. This contractor has done a number of items of police stations. I, the last one I had the pleasure to open, I think is the finest police station in country, Tobago, at Shervan Road. Because that was another story too, you know. It used to be Old Grange Police Station, another house that outlived its usefulness. Years upon years of the same stupidness. When we eventually agreed to what was going to be done and it was approved and funded, good thing I'm a Tobagoian. I go to Tobago and I meet them going to build Old Grange Police Station on a bank. And on this bank, it required $15 million of foundation to put it there. Well, at that stage, I had to intervene and decided that I'm, enough is enough. It doesn't have to be built there. Get a piece of flat million dollars. And that is why Shervan Police Station in Shervan, I know they still want to call it Old Grange. Because <laughs> as far as they're concerned, Old Grange Police Station being replaced, it has to be in Old Grange and it has to be named Old Grange. You would not believe what you have to put up with in this country. One of the best police stations in the country. And of course, this one is another one that another story. Somewhere along the way, somebody decided to get rid of the police marine branch. Before crime was washing this country, there was a marine branch because somebody knew that you needed to have the police on the coastline, right up against the coastline. Somebody knew that. And there was a marine branch. But then somebody decided to get rid of the marine, marine branch and replace it with nothing. So we left that littoral zone open and available to the improving criminal element and boy did they love it. But of course, in the police service, you had one branch saying you don't need it and the other branch saying we need it. And of course, you don't get it because somehow the negativos tend to always win. As head of the National Security Council, I encourage and support the decision that the police service must have a marine presence within the Gulf here. And I'm happy today to hear that the current head of the police service agrees with that and sees it as an integral part of policing of our urban area in the southwest across the central and down to south. So very soon we will have an operation in the sea where there are police officers on watch underwater to protect our coastline, the very closest of the coastline, closest to the population centers in this country. Now that makes this station not only best located on the main and single route into the western peninsula, western main road, but at the back of this station, the police can operate into the Gulf of Paria and this station would have what other stations don't have and is a pier. Out of this yard, onto a pier, onto a vessel and the police is operating on the water. So very soon we expect to have that as an addition to the police service. There are many people who believe that there is a switch somewhere that you have to have a plan to flick or you actually go up and flick the switch and you will turn off the crime scourge in the country. But ladies and gentlemen, that is good for sensational news at a time whenever we are forced into trauma by the criminal element or whenever we find ourselves analyzing either without all the information or with a certain element of non-description. Crime fighting in Trinidad and Tobago is unnecessary. It has been with us and it is always going to be with us. But the problem is that certain developments in our society has allowed the criminal element to grow and to fester in such a way that the actions of the minority criminal element in a largely law-abiding society has become the major concern of that society because of the behavior of those criminals. And there is no one thing that is required to be done to face that. There are a number of things, and as I say that, I want to welcome Father Gregory with us this evening. I will just observe him sitting here with us. Thank you very much for joining us on this occasion.
Let's start with that. Long time before you were in this situation, most if not all parents used to ensure that their children used to go to church somewhere in some religion and be taught that there's good and bad, there's evil, and of course that there's a requirement for personal conduct and personal responsibility. That is not taught in this society as it used to be. Not taught. Most people today are much better off passing on their responsibility onto somebody else rather than assuming that responsibility where it really lies. So at home, you take no time and no responsibility to look after your children, to teach them certain things so that they'll behave in a certain way, and you say that is for the teacher in the school. And of course, nowadays, the same children have no compunction in going into a church and putting a gun to Father Harvey head. That's what they produce. Certain kinds of behavior produce certain kinds of things. And as you do that, you end up with more and more persons. If they see others prospering from a certain kind of behavior, they too think that they can prosper. So you get more of that. And then they get emboldened and they operate out of fear. Either you do this or I do that. And I can show you I'm not joking. Let the blood flow. And of course, in response to that, we as a people have to maintain our composure and reject that and keep doing all the things that have to be done. I'm pleased to hear the commissioner say, as he said a while ago, that they have been given the resources. Meaning, not every single thing that you could want on every single occasion you have. But basically, you have the body of resources, manpower, equipment, support and training, technological improvements. Ladies and gentlemen, as we talk about these things, you all have no idea how much it's costing us as a people. It must have been two years ago, I think it was, when in the national budget, the single largest item allocated in the budget was national security. Fortunately, we don't have to do that every year because we do that every year for education. But in that year, so serious was the situation and so much did we have to allocate to that issue of conduct and behavior in this society that national security became the number one issue not health not education not infrastructure national security and what is worse even after that our community is no safer and we feel no safer because the criminal element those who have chosen crime as a way of life and in case you don't believe it take it from me there are people in this society who have chosen criminal conduct as a way of life. So when you hear the parliamentarians, where I have another hat on, saying to you, when we first talk about giving people bail, you have been accused of doing something, and if the police charge you, you should be able to go to court and in our constitution of 1962, 1962, you are a different set of people. You are entitled under the Constitution to reasonable bail. We got our independence on that basis, and nobody thought that bail was a big issue in this country. But when you reach the point where handguns are in the country, available for rent, and there are people willing and able to use them, one handgun carrying 15 rounds, that has the potential to kill 15 people. A high-powered rifle and assault rifle has the potential to penetrate the wall of the average house in this country on one side and go out the other side. In that scenario I've just mentioned, bail now becomes an issue. Because you cannot expect that those who have chosen crime and criminality as a way of life choose to arm themselves with those weapons that you manage luckily as police officers put your life on the line and you manage to apprehend them and you come to the court and bail is available and they back on the street get another gun for another assignment if that is what's going to go on in this country then what how the hell do you expect it to change and then of course you have certain people in this country who believe who believe that this crime scourge is valuable to them politically and I could talk like that.
Because I was an opposition leader in this country. I was in the opposition. And when the government of the day came with two items to add to the toolkit of crime fighting, they said, one, we want to be able to deny these people bail once you are held with a firearm that is unlicensed. It means that you have taken a decision to become a criminal because having a firearm that is unlicensed, you have made yourself a criminal. It's a crime. And therefore, just having a firearm that is unlicensed, you have taken a decision to label yourself a criminal. And you have done so expecting to use that firearm. Firearms kill people, but you also expect to get away undetected. That's what you're living with. So we said bail has to be reviewed. If you are caught with a firearm, you then the state has 120 days to begin your prosecution because we want quick prosecution. These people are dangerous. So you want a quick prosecution to put them where they belong, which is behind bars. And even when they're behind bars, they're still running the crime outside. So 120 days without bail and the state has the responsibility to bring that case to court. Nobody is throwing you there to rot. It's 120 days. But the law also says that the state must bring the matter to trial and get on with it. We in the opposition, we supported that. So your government and your opposition working together because that denial of that bail infringed the constitution. And it is not that you can't infringe the constitution because if the circumstances warrant it, the very constitution says you must infringe it if you wish. But to do so, you require a certain number of votes in the parliament, meaning no minority in the parliament. No government is simply a plain minority. You need more than half of those in the parliament to support it, meaning that if that happens, then it really is something that the society wants. So in my time as opposition, government says they want it, they need opposition votes. We voted with the government. And for the period, we said also that because this is infringing that right that is in the Constitution to, to, to bail, that you wouldn't leave it in permanently. We will use it when we need it. And now we need it. So we put a sunset clause on that law. Use it for two years or three years. And at the end of it, you have to review it. And if the circumstances warrant it, you can continue having it. So, it was in use. Many persons, many lives were saved by persons who were caught with firearms during that period, who were incarcerated for the period of 120 days, while the DPP's office worked quickly and, of course, assisted the police in getting some of them charged and incarcerated. Somehow, when it came up for renewal, in a situation of more brazen activity on the part of the criminals, more firearms on the streets, more heinous deaths in the news, some parliamentarians decide we no longer are going to have this. You don't have our votes to have that. So that tool has been removed. The other tool that was brought to us in the opposition by the government of the day was the interception of telecommunications. Because in today's world, everybody is talking. A lot of business being done on the phone. Good business and bad business being done on the phone. So our security agencies, which cost us a lot of money to operate, because you want to know what they are thinking, what they are doing, who they are talking to, and what they intend to do. Because if you don't have that, it's called intelligence. Don't mean you're bright. It means you want to know what they're doing. And to do that, you had to infringe on the rights of their privacy in their telephony. That requires the opposition votes. And what did we do in the opposition? We voted with the government to pass into law in this country the ability for the state to listen to some people's conversation. And not everybody can do it. Eh? It's limited to the commissioner of police and a couple of other people, not the minister. Those charged with law enforcement could listen and out of that, you are able to hear sometimes and to piece together who is talking to whom. And I can tell you, 
if in today's world you don't have the ability to do that then you are out of the picture out of the frame because that is how crime fighting whether it's terrorism or even domestic violence is fought so we supported it because it was another tool that the crime fighters needed so today we don't have we don't have the extended bill we go to the parliament we broke it back because we know we need the police is telling us we need it it's going to help us because some of these fellas you pick them up on a charge you put them for 120 days it takes the pressure off some people it takes the leadership out of some communities out of some gangs and you can then be able to begin to get the upper hand no 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 we don't have it the senators voted for it other parliamentarians don't want that they want to come in the newspaper and give me advice the prime minister gets so much advice a lot of it unsolicited and a lot of it is simply to get the five lines in the papers and the five minutes on television because much of the advice is what we all already know but you could give me advice in every newspaper but when we come to the parliament to make gang activity a criminal activity a criminal offense you don't want no part of that before we were being told that a lot of the crime is driven by criminal conduct through the organizing of gangs but what you didn't know being in a gang organizing a gang was not an offense so we had to make it an offense if that is the cancer we're trying to to, to eliminate so we come to the parliament with the anti-gang act with all kinds of protections from abuse but making gang organization membership in a gang recruiting in a gang using a gang all of that serious criminal activity with serious penalties but in Trinidad and Tobago there are those in the parliament who say we're not voting for that and the bill was voted down in the parliament the same people who are giving all this advice to the government in the newspapers the go-to ones that you run to when that bill came to the parliament they voted against it it was only when you the people on that situation at that time said this is ridiculous you all are damaging our future then they came back to the parliament asking that we open the parliament immediately don't use um, amend the standing orders because if something fails in the parliament you can't bring it back under six months they said no 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 because of so much pressure from the people let's bring it back one time and pass it that's how the bill the, the anti-gang bill was passed when the parliament resumes in a few weeks what was passed in the senate will be going to the lower house where your elective representatives all those who are giving us advice about how to fight crime and how crime is number one in the country and the prime minister fail and this one that and this election that and that watch carefully and see what happens in the lower house i can give you peace of division today the 23 members of the government will vote for what was passed in the senate you watch carefully and see what's going to happen in the lower house when we come back and say to them we need to restrict bail for people who are threatening the lives of every citizen in this country and all those who feel that it is the prime minister failure and it's the prime minister fault the first day a gunman put a gun in your face or your family face you will know it don't go so we are all in this together none of us none of us excluded from the scourge of crime in this country and for those who believe that obstructing the country's effort to fight the criminal element is politically valuable i say to you no traitor carry a bigger tea than that because you are risking every single thing in Trinidad and Tobago from our investment to the comfort of our newborn babies ladies and gentlemen you have no idea what a government has to put up with in Trinidad and Tobago and some people who know better make themselves available to advance fully at your expense 
I opened the papers. Well, fact, I didn't have to open it. It was on the front page last week. And I see the government having to go and fight expensive lawyer being threatened with courthouse because a lot of the nonsense has its final, its finale in the courthouse. Eh? And the government is being sued by Venezuelan nationals in Trinidad and Tobago demanding that they be registered because if they are not registered as per this demand that the government will be taken to court and the demand and the, the, the pre-action protocol says what they are asking for in relief is that they be registered they be given the year to work as the others have been given and they be given a commitment that they will not be deported after the year and some other demand that they're making. Now, I want to figure out that that is in, is in some other country. That couldn't be in Trinidad and Tobago. And then I look at the lawyer and I see that Trinidad and Tobago lawyer. And I say that these my economic migrants really have money they have no use for. Because it could not be that we in this country who opened our doors left it open some people say for too long some people say we left the door open too long and at some time later on we said to venezuelans who have been coming here we are going to have a period of registration so we gave weeks of notice that there will be a period of registration we said that in a particular day for a two-week period we start that registration at locations in this country, Trinidad and Tobago. And if you are a Venezuelan and you are here, you must go and register. You and your children, all of you, go and register there. So we can know who is here and we are reaching out to you and giving you our country's hospitality. Some people got very upset about that. Some people didn't like it, but as a country, we conducted ourselves with a certain amount of civility and responsibility and humanity and we ended up registering 15,000 odd Venezuelans in this country. And we closed the floor, we closed the door and we put Venezuelans on visa and we managed them. Well, there are those who say the government has no policy. You want a clearer policy than that? You come for a period of time, you register, you are told you are going to be able to work in this country, at the end of a year, we look at it again. If you find yourself not registered, and this was a piece of the policy that was said in clear and simple English, if you do not take advantage of the registration that we are offering, we will take that to mean that you did not want the government to know who you are and where you are, and we therefore do not want you in this country. So therefore, if you don't register during that period, we are going to deport you back to your homeland. That was the policy. That is the policy. And they could go to the court. They could go wherever they want to go. But the policy of Trinidad and Tobago remains. If you did not register during that period of registration, I have instructed the Minister of National Security to deport every single one of them. And let me tell you the danger in that. Let me tell you what is playing out there in case you all don't know. Those people are now under some cover of UNHCR. They have been moving heaven and earth to get Trinidad and Tobago to open refugee camps in this country. As a prime minister, as a government, we said no. Because we know that once you open a refugee camp in your country, you cannot close it. And the threat to us, a little country like this, with 1.3 million people on a little piece of land, and 33 million potential migrants next door, and you go and start any refugee story here, the end in Trinidad and Tobago would be worse than the end in Venezuela. So we resolutely refuse to have any refugee arrangements in Trinidad and Tobago. Opposition members demanding that we pass law to give refugees the rights in Trinidad and Tobago. We say we have enough law to give them all humanity and whatever rights they are under our Trinidad and Tobago laws. And it went very smoothly. And we have 15,000 people here who I'm sure our people will make welcome and share with them what little we have as a people. If we are forced 
by any arrangement to acknowledge and accept people who declare themselves refugees when in fact they're economic migrants looking for a better cup of food in our country. That changes the ball game completely. So we are making it abundantly clear that we don't have to label people refugees to be good and kind to them. We don't have to fall under the advice of the UNHCR to know that if people are within our borders, those who we can absorb, that we do what we have done. And to date, Trinidad and Tobago on a per capita basis has done more and better than any other country in the world responding to refugees. <laughs> lawyers don't come cheap. But if we don't get good lawyers to argue this demand, I don't know what the outcome will be. But we'll fight it to the finish. And in the meantime, as fast as we pick them up unregistered, we are going to put them in detention and we are going to export them back to their country. They had every opportunity, every opportunity to come forward and get registered. And those who are bringing them through the illegal entry points and those who are penetrating our border do not expect any sympathy from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The same people who are advising us to close our borders and to do what has to be done because the government is failing and the Prime Minister, you can't close your border with a sheet of galvanized. The Commissioner of Police just told you there are three layers going out from the shore. The inshore, we'll have our marine police. Out to 12 miles, we'll have our interceptors. And of course, outside, you need bigger vessels. You would have heard this government telling you, in this period of stringency, we have two vessels under construction in Australia. And when they get here, we'll be in a much better position. But in the meantime, we are making do with all that we have. And they are all deployed to ensure that we give ourselves the best protection, the equipment that we have can give us. You know the same people who five years ago refused to put us in a position to close our borders and to protect our installations 80 or 150 miles out in the sea. The same people are the go-to people in this country and the press printing a set of paper. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister. I want to give you the assurance that have no fear. When you go to bed at night, you have a Prime Minister who is not doing the police commissioner work who is not doing the work of the Minister of National Security. This country has a Prime Minister who is doing Prime Minister work. And with every passing day, we'll get stronger. This period of our strength started with the appointment of a Commissioner of Police, with the settling of a site for a Karinaj police station, with the removal of criminal police from the police service, and all of that. We have more work going on in the prisons, we're working with the fire service, we're training our youngsters in the barracks, and all we ask the people of Trinidad and Tobago is to hold on to your independence and have faith and confidence in yourself and your country. That's all I ask of you. There is no shortcut. Of course, blame is to throw around. But if there are people in our society who have taken crime as a way of life, thank God it's not you, not your children, but they're there. They're there. And we have to deal with them within the law. Our social program in this country is better than anywhere else in the Caribbean. Did you know that? The social support program in Trinidad and Tobago it's the best in the region. You go through the islands, some of them don't get old age pension. They don't get disabilities. They don't get social support, make work programs. Even the make work programs themselves have turned into criminal empires. And on that score, we are working very assiduously to come up with an arrangement where persons who choose crime as a way of life will find themselves this those persons will find themselves outside of what the government has to offer 
in the context of help to those who need help. We are not about fostering crime and criminality in our social support programs. But of course, you know, I could say that. I'm not on those programs. The people on those programs are the ones in the firing line. And let me explain to you what's ha what was happening before and what is happening now. When the government first started providing cash support by way of those make work programs, special works, remember special works? Dude, URP, individuals used to go on those programs in person and do some work and get paid by the day. That created a national conversation that they